Sneakers and Cleats, the podcast. All right, welcome back to the Sneakers and Cleats podcast. It's Thursday, June 6th. This is episode 107. I think I've set a record for the amount of papers I have in front of me, which is impressive. Um, Chuck McIntyre, Matt Roy here. Chuck, how are you today? It's great to be with you on episode 107. 107, and uh, just as we start, remember to download, rate, review, subscribe to the Sneakers and Cleats podcast on YouTube and on um, any podcast app. Today is D-Day as well. I want to get this in early. Today is the 80th anniversary of uh, the invasion of Normandy. I did not know that. You didn't? No, I did really? not. That's the first I've heard of that. Okay, okay so today educated. is the 80th, 80th anniversary of the invasion of Normandy, the biggest amphibious invasion in uh, modern warfare history. So uh, thank you to everybody who had troops there, who had uh, family members there, uh, I think over 10,300 allied troops died that day. So uh, tip of the hat to all of them and obviously always in our thoughts and prayers as the military city USA that we are here. So, Amen. Um, got a lot to talk about today. I did wake up uh, and, and something weird happened this morning. So I went to sleep and I'm weird. I have a glass of milk before I go to bed every day uh, and I added in a Broncos cup. My wife was very nice and she brought me a cup of coffee this morning and I had that in a Broncos mug. And so on my nightstand, I had two Broncos drinking vessels. And I was like, and it just made me realize, like, man, I want football season to be here so bad already. <laughs> See, and I'm at the point in my life where I enjoy this time of year. I like OTAs and minicamp. I like to see how the baby is made, so to speak, right? I mean, so I, I, I like this time weird. of year. I, don't, I It is, I know. <laughs> this is... This is the best time of year. I think I think I enjoy this part and training camp more than I enjoy the actual games at this point. Certain websites in Texas where you see babies being made are, are banned in Texas, so yes. we're not going to, you know. I meant the that so- metaphorically. Sausage, sausage yes. being made. <laughs> yes, that's right. Um, I like this part too, but it's like after this week when OTAs are done and you have to wait until training camp, that's just the worst time of year. Because you don't hear from the NFL basically at all for the next month and a half except for if something bad happens and you don't want to see headlines about the NFL because you know that those headlines are going to be someone had a DUI or someone had XYZ and you just don't want to see But that. see, if you've been doing this a while, you make the time from end of mini camp to the start of training camp worth your while. So I think I've got like 10 interviews in the bag that I'm going to be sprinkling in between now and the end of training camp. So yeah, tune in. <laughs> there will always be football, Matthew. There will always be football. You sound like Roger Goodell. So we got a lot going on today. So Chuck was up at mini camps this week. We're going to get into it with him about his main takeaways. Going to have to have him empty the uh, proverbial uh, notebook. Um, we're going to pick up uh, the NBA draft in three weeks. Who the Spurs are going to pick to join Victor Wembanyama with their fourth and sixth or fourth and eighth picks? Excuse me. NBA Finals starting tonight. Who are we going to see winning that? Um, Dallas and uh, Boston going to start their series up in Boston, and then we're also going to talk about Caitlin Clark. So uh, there was obviously a big controversy this past weekend on Saturday. Um, Caitlin Clark has set the WNBA on fire. A lot of veterans in the league not ta- not liking it too much. Um, So we'll talk about that controversy that literally everybody in the sports media landscape has an opinion on right now. So um, we'll play a couple of people who are more educated in that, Michael Wilbon, Gino Gino Oriema as well. So we'll talk about that a little bit as well. Um, Meantime, number game, we start with 107. Obviously, I just mentioned I'm a big Bronco fan, so you know who I think of. I think of John Elway every single time, twice on Sunday, whenever I uh, think of number seven. it's Number seven is only one thing for me. It's John Elway. Okay, but you've got some good ones on the list. For me, right up off the top, Mickey Mantle, of course, and then Michael Vick. I don't know why. When I think of seven instantly, if I'm being honest, I don't know why Michael Vick would pop into my mind probably even before Mickey Mantle at this really? point. Really? Maybe just because of – I saw Michael Vick play. I yeah. never saw Mickey Mantle play <laughs> that I remember. I mean, Mickey Mantle, there's a lot of good ones. John Elway, Cristiano Ronaldo is number seven as well. And I think when you think of great number sevens, there's three of them. There's Cristiano Ronaldo, there's John Elway, there's Mickey Mantle. <laughs> well, first of all, you, you said Ronaldo's first name, which was obviously, that's news to me as well. The fact that he wore number seven, also news to really? me. Really? Yes. He's, he's worn seven everywhere he's been. Manchester United, Juventus, um, uh, who, who was he with forever? Real Madrid, thank you. Um, he's been with them forever. Uh, he's arguably the best player yeah. of all time. I mean, Pele. But I don't Lionel even remember Messi. what number Pele wore to you. Was it 10? Pele, what, what number would Pele win? Where? Don't, don't ask Luis. 
No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, I'm, just, I'm looking for anybody to ask because no, I don't kidding. know. <laughs> I don't no. actually don't remember what the number Pele wore. Uh, 10 sounds right. Uh, I see Luis uh, looking it up over there. Yeah, don't hold me to it. Okay, let's move he, along. Well, I, he's, I'm <laughs> curious now. What is it? 10? Okay. Is it? Oh, okay. It wow. Look at you. So him, Messi. But you think of seven, you think, you know, Ronaldo. I think John Elway just because John Elway is arguably the most talented quarterback to ever come into the league. I mean, I think he was the picture-perfect prototype for a quarterback and and you saw him play more than I did I did but that's kind of his um claim to fame is he was the number one pick he was the very clear-cut number one pick in the 83 draft with five other quarterbacks alongside of him Dan Marino obviously being in that draft as well uh Jim Kelly in that draft Todd Blackledge but he was the he was the presumptive and and clear-cut number one pick because of the body type, because of the arm talent, because of all those things. And I think he lived up to form. What I was shocked at, Matthew, was I did a story on him during the preseason after he had already done some great things and how accommodating he was and also how close to my size he was. That's what really? blew me. I couldn't believe it. I, I, what blew me away, I should say. Uh, <laughs> you know, it just – yeah, arm talent – brain the fact that you know there was a little bit of mysticism around him because he was such a great baseball player too but yeah and then rightfully you know for the guy that was tagged for his whole career could never win the big one and then won a couple of big ones late yeah i've uh told the story before i met john when i was like three or four years old and that nicest guy ever in the thing is, apparently, the reputation is that he's not the nicest guy ever to a lot of his fans and stuff. But to me that day, he was a hero. To me, he's always going to be the the Bronco that I think of besides, like, Champ Bailey and stuff like that. So, uh, John Oway, I'll f- always a uh, hat tip to him. Um, in 2007, the Colts beat the Bears as seven-point favorites. That was – I always think of that as a non-Colts play. I always think of the Devin Hester opening kickoff taken back. I know exactly where I was when I saw that game, too. Um, 29-17, Peyton Manning, the MVP. Prince was the halftime show of that one, which was also impressive. Yeah, oh, yeah. That was a great show. Oh, yeah. Um, 2007, the Patriots also went 18-0. Obviously, they lost the Super Bowl in 08, technically, but that was the 2007 18-0 Patriots going for 19-0, the David Tyree catch, all that stuff. Uh, yep, I was and, at that one. Were you? Yep. Oh, nice. That's a good uh, one to be at. Basketball. I just got the update. Can- Cowboys canceled their on-field work today. We'll get to that in a little bit. Um, basketball, the Spurs swept the Cavs. The- I think of that as the easiest of the Spurs finals wins. Like, that Cavs team had no business being in the finals. You could make the I argument mean, they- that that Spurs team had no business being in the finals, too. Is that so? Yeah. Absolutely. They Things worked out. I believe Dallas, who was the one seed, got knocked out, I think, in the first round. Yeah, wasn't that the year that they got knocked out by the yeah. Baron Davis Warriors? Yes, I think so. You know, my memory is I think it fleeting. Was, but that was the year after they lost to the Heat in the finals, and then they came back as the one seed lost in the first round. Of the but I think season. once that happened, it was like, okay, here we go again. I just remember having to cancel another vacation. That was one of those, <laughs> you could plan all you wanted. You could think, well, the Spurs aren't going to do it this year. Or like even late in the year, you go, well, they're not going to get past Dallas. Then Dallas loses in the first round. Instantly, everybody starts canceling their <laughs> vacations because here we go again. <laughs> I mean, I think uh, next time that happens, we'll be happy that you have to cancel yes, vacations. Yes, I think so too. Especially, uh, yeah, well, I mean, again, we've been spoiled. So if it happens again, I mean, it literally would be like lightning striking twice. Yeah, that would be that. So that was their fourth championship in eight years. Um, like I said, I think that was the easiest one just because you had the Zildrunas, Elgowskis, LeBron James, Booby Gibson, Cavs, and you're like, who the hell are these people? <laughs> and so uh, that Cavs. LeBron basically willed that Cavs team to go to the finals. Yeah, and Tony Parker basically willed that team, too. I mean, that was – Tony was the best player on the Spurs that year during that playoff run. And I believe it was August 7th in baseball. Barry Bonds passed Hank Aaron as the uh, all-time home run king, 756th home run, August 7th of 2007. Um, I don't want to get devolved into too far into this conversation, but do you think – when you think home run king, do you think Barry Bonds or do you think – Hank Aaron. I think of Barry Bonds. Because of the number? Yeah, just because of the number. Because I mean, it's not that I don't is. think of Hank, too, because, I mean, my whole life, until Barry Bonds, it was Hank. So, you know, it's it's different eras, and obviously you can spitball and hypothesize or even probably have some intel as to what was happening with Barry Bonds at the time. 
but at the end of the day, you still got to go do it. And I can assure you, whatever Barry Bonds has been accused of doing, and even if he did it, I can assure you, he was not the only one doing it at the time. The crappy thing with Barry, and that I always think about, is like he didn't need it. Like maybe he needed it to be the home run king, yeah. but he was already a Hall of Famer before he, anything got right. injected in, into his arm. And so. I've said this before too, and I'll wrap this up quickly. It's, it's if we're basing, you know, whether a guy gets into the Hall of Fame, whether or not a player has been vetted or not for something they may or may not have done, then it's not fair to Bonds and Clemens and some of these other guys when. I can also assure you there are other guys who did similar things that are already in the Hall of Fame. Absolutely. And then uh, the World Series that year, the Red Sox swept the Rockies. Very easy sweep for them. They did That was not a competitive series whatsoever. Uh, I think that was a the, lot of run scored. That was the Josh Beckett uh, uh, Red Sox team. The Josh juice Beckett. ball era, too. Yeah, exactly. They, they, killed, yeah. they killed the Rockies yeah, that good year. Good old Josh getting another ring out of that, too, and Abs- well earned. Absolutely. Um, let's get to the NBA. So a couple of mock drafts uh, coming coming out this past week. Um, ESPN's mock draft has the Spurs taking Stephon Castle, the UConn product, uh, at number four, and Tijane Saloon. I'm not going to be able to pronounce that name until draft day. I'm sorry. It's the French um, power forward. At number eight, CBS has them taking Nikola Topic at four, and then the Providence guard, Devin Carter, at eight. There's a lot. You're going to see, I feel like people who don't pay attention to the draft that much, especially this year, usually there's like a number one pick and maybe a top three, and then a bunch of people maybe you hadn't heard of or maybe like different selections. This year, every mock draft you see is going to be different. They're going to have a different player at one, two, three, four. Maybe Alex Saar is going to be number one now, but – you're going to see different players in the top 10. This is a perfect example of that. Four, there are two picks, four different players. Who do the Spurs like? That's a great freaking question because they're never going to tell us and we're not going to find out until that night. They can like Reed Shepard. They could like Rob Dillingham. They could like Stephon, uh, Stephon Castle. They could like uh, Klingon. They can like any of these guys and we're never going to find out until the pick is suggested. On yeah, number I think. You know, at least for me personally, things have changed over time. And the last five or six years, at least, the NBA treats this kind of information with if you talk to scouts or, you know, if you used to be able to talk to scouts or front office people off to the side, they'd kind of give you the lay of the land of what things were looking like. But the NBA now treats this as proprietary information and only their business partners, their broadcast partners are going to be or have access to this type of information. You know, you can still talk to baseball scouts, baseball front office people behind the scenes about where they think things are going to go in a draft. Same thing with the NFL. You can still talk to agents. You can still talk to scouts. And there's a little more of a feel. So based on what I just said, like I don't have any problem going into an NFL draft saying where I think, you know, certain guys going to go, especially locally, if I've talked to some people, because these people know, and they know because they're talking with other people too. And so you're formulating your opinion based on opinions of people that are going to be pulling the levers on these things. I personally don't have any contact right now with anybody that's looking at this draft. So I wouldn't even feel comfortable spitballing with, yeah. with who's going to go where and who's going to do what or any of that well, stuff. Well, and there's such, there's such varying opinions on these guys, too. I mean, one team loves Reed Shepard. One team hates Reed Shepard. One team loves Bronny James. One team hates Bronny James. I just you, – you'll, you're never going to get a consensus with this draft. So I feel better about looking at this draft like, okay, what are the needs of the team? And so with the Spurs – They have two very clear needs that I think we have seen all year. They need somebody who can pass the ball to Victor, and they need someone who can catch a a ball on the outside from Victor and shoot it and actually make the shot. And they need some dogs. Like, you need more dogs, right? You need guys that are just JYDs, junkyard dogs like Mario Ellie, guys that are happy for the opportunity, happy to show that they can not only play, but they're going to go out and defend somebody super hard, night in and night out, give maximum effort. Those are, That's what this team needs more of, too. I do feel comfortable also saying people that I 
personally want on this team. I want Reed Shepard on this team. He can shoot the lights out. He can play good defense, and he can facilitate. Those are three things that this team needs. Those are three things that he does really well. Stephon Castle, another guy. He's a UConn guy. Didn't get as much run as he probably would have on a worse team. But obviously, UConn was the best team in the country right. all year long. Danny Hurley possibly now going to the Lakers as well. Um, he was one of the best players on that team. And in the NBA, if he plays point guard, he can uh, – he can shoot, play defense, and pass the ball as well. So those are two guys that I would really like to see on this team. And I've heard a lot of people talking about now all of a sudden that this is the worst draft in years. Yeah, that's BS. Yeah, I mean, I mean, again, I don't know what to believe. <laughs> I'm not getting any intel anywhere, so yeah, I'll just see what they pick, and I'm sure we'll be just fine with it. I'll tell you who I don't want is uh, Nikola Topic, just because of the knee injury. He already tore his ACL this past off season, or this, excuse me, this past Europe season. So um, never a fan of drafting injured guys because you never know what's going to happen at the next level as well. So um, with that being said, the, Oh, I wanted to ask you as well. The NBA for the first time ever is going to have a two day draft. They're going to have first round, second round aired in two days. Do you think what, first of all, what do you think of that? And second of all, do you think that's because Bronny James is going to be drafted day two, most likely. Oh, well, I hadn't thought of that. Maybe. That's, I mean, that that, was, that's, that's fair. That's my theory, is that they're basically making this a two-day thing. They're One, they want to test the success of it, because obviously the NFL has had unmitigated success, unparalleled success in uh, a three-day draft. And by moving it around to different cities and all that stuff, one of the genius moves from the uh, NFL. The NBA now still doing it in Brooklyn, doing it two nights. But I really think that they're doing that because of the brawny factor. That's. I mean, if you're spitballing, I, I can I could be down with I, that. I think that that's a. I mean, yeah. it, obviously, it's my opinion, so I think it's smart. But, I, <laughs> <laughs> but I think that that makes a lot of sense. Like, there's only a certain few teams that are interested in Bronny James, or that Bronny is even interested in going to. I think he only accepted invitations from two teams out of ten, and it's like, why else would they do it besides trying to test if it's good? I mean, if it works, if you're going to get viewership. ESPN would be stupid not to air it in this on that second day. But what I don't get is like the second round of the NBA draft is not like the second round in the NFL draft. No, I mean, because contracts aren't guaranteed, right? I mean, I don't know if that's still contracts the case. Are, I think contracts are guaranteed in the in, NBA. In, not in the second round, though. Oh, right, right, right. No. Right, right. So, I mean, at least unless they've changed it. And again, they maybe they have. I really haven't been paying that much attention to it. But, you know, I think maybe, too, it could be a chance to celebrate first round guys a little more than they do Maybe. because once they get going it's it's pretty rapid fire but you know again i think if you're an nba fan and you have a team that has a pretty high draft pick you're probably going to tune in and then if you know if you, this is one of those sports that you know maybe you're a fan of the team but you know you can you'll be perfectly fine at looking at x you know later in the night to see who got what you know i uh, but I can see a reason for stretching it out, especially this time of year where there's really not a lot on TV anyway, sports related. I get that for sure, uh, and that'll be after the Stanley Cup. That'll be after the NBA Finals. Yeah. Like there's there's not a lot on TV, so I, I could see them grasping at viewership uh, late in ju late in June. Uh, let's talk about the NBA Finals real quick. So um, NBA Finals starting tonight: Celtics, Mavs. The Mavs have probably I I would say this is a stretch. They have two of the best three players in the series, I think. Fourth one would be Jalen Brown, but I think Luka is the best player in the series. I think Jay Jason Tatum's the second best. You could make an argument Kyrie Irving is the second best. You could make a ar very strong argument that the Mavs have the two best players on the on the on uh, either roster, but then you could make another argument that the Celtics have the next six. <laughs> How do you see how do you see the series and how do you see the matchups and all that stuff? I don't know. I said at the beginning of all the playoffs, A B D, anybody but Dallas. You know, <laughs> normally my my default is like if it's a Texas team, right? Oh, you're pulling for the Texas team. But there's just something about the logo that, you know, and, and all those bitter rivalries with the Spurs through the years, through the decades. Anybody but Dallas, of course they're in the finals. So you may as well run to Vegas right now and bet on the Mavericks. But, I mean, it looks like – A lot of people have. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the hot streak that they're on in terms of who they've had to beat to get here, where they've come seating-wise to get here, you know, the fact that – I don't know. It, it's You could say, no, everything's setting up for Boston. It's just 
I, I don't like the fact that I said at the beginning of all this, anybody but Dallas, and here they are in the finals. So. Well, here's the here's so here's the thing for me. It's like I think if Dallas loses a close series, let's say it's four two, and and the Celtics win, I think it's still a successful season for Dallas. If the Celtics don't win the finals, it's a failure of a season for the for the Celtics, just because they've had the easiest path to get there. Everybody in the East got hurt. Donovan Mitchell got hurt. Jimmy Butler got hurt. Um, Tyrese Halliburton got hurt. Even though Chris Stapps went down, it's not like you lost Jason Tatum. It's like every single thing has broken their way. Yes, they have been a dominant team throughout the entire uh, regular season. They've been dominant throughout the postseason, albeit with the injuries to the other to their opponents. I think if they don't win a win a championship with this team in this layout against this team. It's a failure of a season, and I have no problem with saying that, and I'll say it to the to the end. Yeah, we talked about this, I think, a few weeks ago, yeah. and I think you're right. From where they've come from, and you know, basically because the hard work was done years ago, building the roster and assembling all that, how they've evolved, I would think that you know, losing at this level is going to feel like a failure, not only for that team, but for that fan base, too, on a lot of levels. So do you think – I know you said anybody but Dallas should – and, and – the, the Celtics have Derek White, who's a former Spurs. Should Spurs fans root for Dallas? Because, well, I wouldn't. Texas, or should they root for the Celtics? So, if I'm a Spurs fan, there's just no way I could put my feelings aside for the rivalry. And it's kind of like, would AM fans be pulling for Texas in a national championship setting just because it's Texas? I don't think so. And vice versa. I don't think Texas fans would be pulling for AM. Like, you think Texas fans are going to be pulling for AM if they get to the College World Series? I don't think so. So that's that's where I'm that. going. I'm allowing my hate to take precedence here. <laughs> I'm rooting for... <laughs> and I have no reason to hate these guys. Right. How can you not like Kyrie? How can you not like Luka. you know the, some of these guys? Yeah, Luca. the rest of these guys on the roster. I mean, there's no reason for me to hate them other than the logo. I did a monologue but that's a, enough. Cu- a couple of weeks ago on Bryson DeChambeau and how he's reinvented his image. I think Kyrie Irving's reinvention of his own image has been like bordering on heroic the way he's done it. Like during COVID, he was at his all-time low. He wasn't getting a vaccine, he wasn't doing all these things. He was I mean and, and Yeah, that's right. Not to not to say anything about vaccines. Right, but how vaccine, how he was treated how he through, was all, treated that, through all of it yeah. and through how he was people were saying he was riding Kevin Durant's mm-hmm. coattail coattails and uh, the way that he left Boston was bad, and just all those things piled up to where you thought that Kyrie was the problem. To where the the point last year when they traded, when the Mavs traded for Kyrie, everyone was like, "Oh, this isn't going to work." And then it was a disastrous right. failure uh, in the first season. The way that he's come back this year and treated everything and and been hu- uh, had some humility and been humble, I think that his reinvention of his own image has been sp- uh, spectacular to the point where I think some of this stuff. Is um, I think people are actually rooting for Kyrie, which is which is something that we you know aren't really accustomed to. Yeah, um, I do want to get to the uh, Caitlin Clark stuff real quick. Um, if you haven't seen it, the Caitlin Clark debacle um, controversy. We're playing the video or the video for you right now. This is basically what happened. I'll just lay it out really quickly. A player named Kennedy Carter. Uh, who spells it C-H-E-N-N, so that's odd in and of itself. But she commits a flagrant foul on Caitlin Clark. This happened on Saturday. Um, It's the latest of the hard fouls that have been against the rookie fever player. Now you have everyone, literally everyone in sports, um, basically coming out with their own hot takes. Before we get to our opinions on this, before we get to our conversation, I want to hear from people who are more educated in this because I think it's fair and I think everyone needs to say – we don't we aren't experts in this we aren't experts in women's basketball because frankly it, had, it hadn't been talked about that much um prior to this and it wasn't in the zeitgeist it wasn't openly um spoken about it wasn't very popular so i would like to hear from another couple of people first before we get into um our opinions on it and so gino oriema one of the best coaches ever in women's basketball and women's college sports he was. Uh, he said yesterday that Clark was being targeted. Uh, let's hear from him real quick on the um, Dan Patrick show this morning. If you're a college player and you're a great college player, like Caitlin was, the delusional fan base that follows her disrespected the WNBA players by saying she's going to go in that league and tear it apart. There were actually odds 
on what are like she's third or fourth in betting odds on being MVP at a WNBA. These people are so disrespectful and so unknowledgeable and so stupid that it gives women's basketball a bad name. Okay, so the kid was set up for failure right from the beginning. So if you're a WNBA player, and I believe me, I've coached the best, and I've pissed them off a lot, and they let me know about it. But they were tremendously disrespected. And none of them are going to say it, but human nature is, okay, this kid's coming into the league. And Diana said it best. This kid's in for a rude awakening. And they all jumped over her, but they didn't read the whole thing that she said. But nobody's printing. You know, Diana Taurasi was right. This kid's on the wrong team. She's got the wrong skill set to handle the physicality of that league. And she's a rookie. And if you're a WNBA player, if you're any kind of player, you're going to say, I'm going to make a statement. Targeted, targeted by society, targeted by her looks, targeted by her reputation, targeted by the disrespect that they've shown to the WNBA. There's a huge target on this kid's back. All right, a lot to react to there, but before we get to that, Michael Wilbon, Tony Kornheiser also had a really good conversation about this. Um, and this takes it in a slightly different direction because there is a lot of race, um, racially charged arguments being out there because Caitlin Clark is white in a predominantly black players league. So Michael Wilbon kind of touches on that. Let's hear from him real quick from Pardon the Interruption. The discussion about Caitlin Clark has to deal with, and I mean initially and loudly, race. Race and culture in America. That's part of this. And basketball is the place, Tony, where it's more often discussed historically. Yes, it started maybe with Jackie Robinson and with certain prize fighters, Jack Johnson. But it's been a basketball discussion. When it was about Larry Bird and Magic Johnson and the sort of enemies they were before they became deep and abiding that their friendship. But I mean, I remember with Spike Lee, a, an important part of his movie making dealt with Bird and dealt with a white star basketball player in America because there ain't one on the male side is Caitlin Clark. And it's okay for people to admit that they identify with some, I identify with people, maybe part of why I identify with Edmonton or people like Evander Kane and Darnell Nurse who are people of color. And so it's okay to identify that. You're not going to find that white American star in men's basketball. Caitlin Clark is that. And she brings people into the tent because yeah. she's great and she's unique. In this case, she's yeah. white in a sport of yeah. black people. That's part yeah, of no the argument. deal. <laughs> um, yeah. Here's where I'm at. And I don't want to... Um, I say this knowing that I am a straight white male in America. No, you don't have to tell anybody. I mean, like we can on camera. I mean, that's yeah. And I and I just want to I just want to say it first because I sometimes things get misconstrued. So I'm just going to be as clear as I possibly can. I don't think I am in a position as a white male in America to say that this is a race thing because I honestly I have no idea. I don't either. It could be. It totally could be. Wilbon could be correct. Stephen A could be correct. Um, Monica McNutt could be correct. The people who are out there saying that it is racially charged because um, it's a white superstar. Pat McAfee went on and said white bleep the right. other day. Um, she is a superstar in the WNBA, or she is a superstar in college that is not a superstar right now in the WNBA. She's only a superstar in name only right now in the WNBA because, frankly, she hasn't been very good so far in the WNBA. Um, and she just happens to be white. So I'm going to leave the race thing race part out of it. I think what needs to be said is there is no problem with being physical in a, in a game. I think Gino had a good point saying that, yeah, Diana Taurasi came in here and said, we're not going to play pussyfoot yeah. with her. Guess what? Diana Taurasi's white, by the way. We, we said that on this show before yeah. she even got to the league that this was going to happen. I don't know why this is so astonishing that when you're talking about a great college player going to a league of professionals who are also great, that's why they're professionals, that this was going to happen, right? Yeah, I, I mean, mean there's, case there, closed. There's nothing wrong with being physical. I mean, the yeah. Kennedy, the, the Kennedy uh, thing was, I think, a one-off. Kennedy Carter, she that was a cheap shot. It wasn't the worst cheap shot ever. Like if you look at Bill Lambeer in the eighties, there's a lot of other crap that was oh, worse yeah. than that. There's um, been a, th historical, you know, references to guys that were hot shots at the college ranks that 
go in and a bunch of dogs are going to get on them and treat them like, you know, yeah. they're, 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 they're alpha dogs trying to let them know that, hey, we know where you're coming from, but in order to get to the next level, you're going to have to go through us first. Yeah, and I think it's multi it's multi layered here, right? Like, Caitlin Clark is the biggest star in women's sports in maybe ever. Like, especially in the the day that we live in right now, she is the biggest star that W that the uh, women's basketball has seen in a, at least a very long time, but probably ever. She is the most prolific scorer ever. She is one of the most fantastic basketball players that anyone has seen on any level. The hype train has let her down. I think Gino's right on the hype train. And that's not, I don't know if that's her fan so much. I think that was a little off from him, the disrespectful yeah, from Yeah, I, I do too, because when he threw fans out there, it's like, what is he talking about? Talk about the Dan Patricks of the world that made this a thing. Yeah, and I mean- so to, to blame now Caitlin Clark's fan base for the fact that she's getting cheap shotted in the in the WNBA, I mean, this that's absolutely I mean, that's a little disingenuous. Yeah, and so I that think that's a little it's a prone little bit to of, hyperbole. It's a little say. bit our fault. Like people who built this up to say Caitlin Clark is gonna run into the WNBA yeah, and she's no, gonna I don't know. Not and she yeah, no, I'm not I'm not saying yeah. us particularly, but people like us who have podcasts who have mics in front of their faces and decided to make to anoint Caitlin Clark the best player in the WNBA has ever seen before she even stepped foot on the court. A lot of things have been feeding into this narrative that Caitlin Clark is going to be this superstar right away. There's a lot of things that have gone against her, though, and there's a reason that there's a target on her back because players are jealous of her. Players are jealous of the amount of uh, endorsements that she has. People are jealous that she has all this attention and that with this attention came so much more attention on the league. Why didn't that happen when... Candace Parker, Diana Taurasi, Leslie um, – why, why am I forgetting her name? Lisa Leslie. Lisa Leslie. Lisa Leslie, thank you. Lisa Leslie was in the league. Why didn't this happen with Brianna Stewart? Why didn't this happen with all these other players? I don't know. I frankly don't know. But what I know now is that Caitlin Clark and her stardom has brought so much attention to a league that was previously, honestly, forgettable. We sometimes forgot. I didn't even know when the WNBA season took place before Caitlin Clark got into the league. I will be completely honest with you because there's all these breaks and I really didn't know. And honestly, I didn't care to know. And so many other people in media didn't care to know either. So many other people around the world didn't care to know. And now you have this superstar that has brought attention to your league, that has chartered flights for you, that has uh, sold out the arenas in Indiana more times than not. And it's okay to be jealous. It's okay to admit that you're a little jealous. But what's not okay is to target her on the court. Yeah, and I mean, I think that that's that is what's happening a little bit. But I yeah. don't think that. I just don't think that people feel it's okay to say, "Yeah, I'm jealous of what she has and what she has brought to us." But I'm also thankful for what she has brought to us because this league is going to explode. Salaries are going to explode because of Caitlin Clark, and it's okay to say that. Yeah, I think you know, just like from the, the you know from the men's side, and although I think you know the two examples I'm going to use, those players enjoyed a little more success early on in their professional careers. But you know, Michael Jordan got knocked into the third row of stands when he was the young buck trying to assert himself. Tiger Woods, the jealousy on the PGA Tour when that guy was blowing up, and yeah. I remember David Ogren, our very own, getting on the Tiger bandwagon very early on, and trying to let people know it's like, or other golfers, like it's okay that he's doing this. There are more eyes on us, which means the purses are going to get bigger. We're all going to benefit by having this transcendent figure kind of running our sport. There's going to be more money or more opportunity for all of us to then go out and make more money. So I think, you know, at some point you would think if the WNBA and, you know, whoever's running the league, their commissioner – has got to put their foot down. You know, Wayne Gretzky's another example. You know, at a certain point, everybody in the NHL knew not to go freaking cheap shot Gretzky and take him out for any reason because, yeah, he's on a really good team, but this is the reason why our sport is becoming more of a, you know, less of a regional sport and more of a global sport because of this one guy. So, you know, it's kind of hard to separate sometimes competition from the business side of it, but – you know, I think with the Caitlin Clark thing, the reason why it didn't happen before is there wasn't a machine 
behind it before. Yeah. You know, you could take what was happening organically and then put it on steroids with all the media attention and then social media and everything else because the social media is going to take its cues too from the amount of coverage that ESPN's giving. And again, that that happened organically. They were just getting on the bandwagon. But when you put that spotlight on it, of course, Caitlin Clark's going to be a star. When everybody was talking about her for every time you, you mentioned women's sports – and women's basketball in particular, what were they talking about? They weren't talking about the WNBA. They were talking about her. Yeah, and you So look don't at, blame the fans, Gino Ariyama. And and you hear people like Angel Reese, who was part of those most watched games. Yeah. Guess what? And she said, and I and I fragmented my sentence there. You hear her say, like, in 20 years, they're gonna remember me too. Right. And they're gonna remember what we built in the NBA. They're gonna remember what I did in the WNBA. Guess what? The numbers in those championship games and the games that you played against Iowa weren't big because of you. They were big because of Caitlin Clark. Maybe they were big a little bit because of the controversy and the this and the this that you had to do in Caitlin Clark's face. They weren't big because of her. If Caitlin Clark wasn't in those games, guess what? You wouldn't have had those numbers. And so to see, to see people like that say, it's clearly jealousy. It's clearly you're jealous of what she has and that you don't. And Angel Reese has been has been taken through the ringer and I and I give her so much respect and admiration for what she has dealt with as a young woman in America and a young star in America but like you can just say it you can just say say it with your chest you're jealous of Caitlin Clark that's fine you know what I mean like that's that it just right so, it's so petty at some point well I mean I think you know the numbers were big on that because it was you had two really good teams right two really big brands you know two prominent coaches you had Caitlin Clark you had Angel Reese. I mean, there were a lot of reasons why people watched that game. It wasn't just because of Caitlin no, Clark. Otherwise, all of Caitlin, Caitlin's games would have been. A lot of them numbers. were. <laughs> no, but I know, but not to that degree. My point, my main point is like Caitlin Clark is doing so much better for the NBA, yes, or the WNBA, absolutely. Than, than any drawbacks. And so players, if, and I haven't spoken to a single WNBA player, but if WNBA players, I'm just judging them off of their actions, are jealous of her, think about the good that she's brought to the league. And I would say the same thing back in the 2000s about uh, about Tiger. Because he, of course, got of the course. media treatment. He still gets the media treatment, even though he's right. not great now. He still gets that. He's still a machine. And if the numbers weren't what they were, she wouldn't get this attention. If the Indiana Fever, fever average attendance at home wasn't 4,000 more than the next one and right. 13,000 people more than the bottom of the league, they wouldn't be talking about this. But guess what? Her jersey sales are higher than some Cowboys. Her uh, Everything else that's going on is better because of Caitlin Clark. Yeah. I, the, the only thing I want to see is, look, I got no problem with people or players playing Caitlin Clark hard, right? Oh, absolutely. That's, 100%. That, that's, that's what this should be about, right? Yeah. Let's just take out the cheap stuff and let's not make everything about race or sexism or, you know, who you love, all that stuff. Let's just play basketball and stop making all this more than what it needs to be. 100%. 100%. Um, real quick, I know we have already gone a little long and we're going to go two more minutes because I want to get a little bit of Cowboys in. You were at the Cowboys camp yesterday. You were, I mean, you were yeah. there this week. I want you to just real quick, give us two, three minutes, empty the notebook for us. What did you see? Who was there? Who was not there? What did Max say? Give us just a little bit of a synopsis here on that. I, the sense I get is that Micah Parsons is going to do Micah Parsons and that's okay because of the time of year that it is. I mean, the mandatory stuff he showed up for, but at the end of the day, some of this is brand building. Some of this is angling with Micah in terms of, you know, trying to have a media presence while he's playing and then after while he's playing too. But man, I could sit there and listen to this guy talk 24 and 7. I mean, he's thoughtful. He's smart. You may not agree with what he has to say, but he knows what he's saying and why he's doing it. Like this isn't anything he hasn't thought of. And I think it's going to be a fascinating year. I mean, it was also cool to kind of, you know, meeting guys for the first time. Uh, Leah Fowl, Maris Leah Fowl, the third round pick from Notre Dame, super sharp kid and obviously comes from a, a very, very talented family. And we're going to get into that in the days ahead. And then I got some Sam Williams stuff too that I think people are going to be curious to hear. I mean, I get the sense, Matthew, that if Sam Williams gets on the field and produces, this is going to be a guy that we want to stick a microphone in front of all the time. I think it's really funny that um, you, my mom, and my sister are the only ones that call me Matthew. 
Just, <laughs> I don't know. I just kind of feel like I'm, think I'm it's so, funny. so much older than you. I, All right. I, you just feel like Matthew to me. You look like a Matthew. All right, Charles. Especially with the glasses. That's fine, too. You, <laughs> I, and I don't know. Even my mom doesn't call me Charles. So that would be a, be a one-off. You uh, The other day, I was looking at something on our website. Um, and I saw Charles Migatinica as the byline. And I was just like, since that, when? That's my since student when? <laughs> So I always find that fascinating, too. Whoever set up my page... So I have to go in and physically change it to Chuck. I don't know why it was set up, Charles, but it is. And some days I just don't feel like changing know, it, which is most days. Yeah, we'll talk more about Cowboys on Monday. Obviously, there was a lot of NBA stuff I wanted to get to that I promised you on Monday that promised we'd get to on Thursday. So um, for everyone who is still tuning in, I appreciate it. And uh, that's all we got for you today on the Sneakers to Cleats podcast. We'll get more into the Cowboys on Monday. We'll talk more about the NBA draft with Don back in. Um, remember to download, rate, review, subscribe, give us a five-star rating, tell a friend, tell an enemy. We are dividing up these episodes on YouTube now, so where we'll have everything kind of segmented off. So if you only want to hear Caitlin Clark, you will only you can only listen oh, to nice. the Caitlin Clark part. If you want to hear about the NBA draft, you can only listen to that part if you want. So make sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel and follow us there as well. I'll tweet all of them out on my social medias. Uh, so we will be right back here on Monday. Everyone, until then, have a good week.